Hello, hello, I'm Li Hao. In the last video, I worked on a 25 days TypeScript challenge, which is the advent of TypeScript. It was so intense, yet rewarding. If you're looking at advancing or level up your TypeScript ability, please do check out the advent of TypeScript challenge. And if you get stuck, you want to have some ideas, please watch my video. Uh, I will show you how I think about the problems as well as how I come up with the solution. While I was working on these challenges, um, one idea came out to me. I was thinking that I was wondering whether I can build something like this platform, this event of TypeScript. So this video is all about that. So this video follows my thought process on how I try to build a clone of something I see online. Usually my, I start with looking at a few key aspects of the platform. In this case, uh, it's the code editor where I can make code changes and see my whether there is some sort of TypeScript errors. So we'll start with building a proof of concept, or usually we call it a POC, to try to see whether we can get something similar to that. Once we get the idea working, then I'll go in deep dive to start from scratch, building a more polished application from, from there on. Right? So we'll work with uh, creating the layout, creating the API, and then also building the whole editor. And this is how the final product looks like. So as you can see over here, we have a list of challenges. And if you click into one of them, you can see um, the challenge description and then some code editor. And then these are the tests uh, that we test against this um, code that we are going to work on. So here, the, we have some basic layouts where you can resize the code editor, resize left, right on the descriptions and the code editor. And if we try to fix this, uh, let's see, I think this is a bit more complex. Let's start with the two. So this is what we're going to fix. Uh, if we're going to come here and make change like this, then you can see on the bottom, all tests have passed. And we, we basically test whether if there's any type errors, then you can see the tests are failing. And so this is the advent of TypeScript UI. And this is what we're going to build in this video. So are you ready? Let's go. Let's first start with creating an empty Svelkit project. To do that, you can come over to your terminal and create a Svelkit project. I'm going to run npm create felt at latest and yes proceed so how do i name my project i'm going to call it a, a advent of typescript clone it will be a skeleton project which is empty i'm going to use typescript of course and i'm going to try svelte 5 preview which is a bit unstable but let's try that and see Oh, hold on. I think I did not select that. Wait, let me try go back again. So I went back and redo the whole process and also remember to select Svelte 5 preview. Svelte 5 at the point of this recording is in release candidate, which means it's not yet a stable release for production use, but it's stable enough and good enough for me to build a advent of TypeScript clone. And of course, eventually it will become stable for production use. So in this video, I'm going to do it for so that my video is future proof and it will be relevant in the future when you use Svelte 5. Right, so uh, now we have created our project. Let's go into the folder of TypeScript clone. I'm going to run npm install to install dependencies. This might take a while. Let's see. And then once the dependency I've installed, um, let me just open my code editor from this location. Okay, this is my project. And of course, let me just run through all the commands you can see over here in the, in the instruction. And I'm gonna run npm run dev opened. So this, what it will do is that it will open up this um, our project in the browser. So it starts the dev server and also open it in the browser so you can see that this is the skeleton project and first thing first is we're going to try um, to build 
a proof of concept, right? So to try to figure out how we can create like the code editor that you see um on the Evan of TypeScript website, right? Here you have two editor and then you can make some changes. You can see the underlying errors and how gonna make that happen. Uh, how how do you make it work? Right. So if if you are hundred percent clueless, unlike what I am now because I've did my research, but if you're hundred percent clueless, where do you start? I guess the best easy way for now is probably you can ask ChatGPT or Google and try to figure what um how 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 to make this happen. And also one lucky thing for us is that Type Hero itself, this website, uh is open sourced. Which means that you can actually look at the source code of this um, portal. Uh, you can scroll all the way down. You can see it has a GitHub uh, link. It goes to this type hero, and I believe this is where um, uh, the source code is, and this is where it creates all the um, code editor. Right? We can of course clone this down and then take a read, uh, figure it out. Right? So. Um, to clone a project it's easy you can run like you can copy this and then run git clones in your um in your laptop and and then you can clone this project right i have done that so i'm not going to do it now again uh, but um, so basically after researching and reading a bit on how it works um let me just walk through how we can create this editor right so the source code itself is written in react so there's a bit of things that we can learn and there are certain things that we have to come up for ourselves. Right? So the um, editor that it uses, if you come back again, you can feel that it. if you're familiar with VS Code, which is what we just opened right now, if you're, ver if you're very familiar with VS Code, right, you can see that this editor looks, it looks and feels almost similar or exactly the same as this editor that you can see over here. right? So um and that's that's a good observation because this is the editor that um VS Code is using. It's called Monaco Editor. So if you search for uh, Monaco Editor, you can find here that it is a open source project from Microsoft, and you can install this uh, Monaco Editor. Uh, and you can use it like this, right? So this is basically the editor itself. Uh, and, can sh and there are some sample or playground that you can use to copy, um, see how it's being set up, right? So you can, like this is a very basic hello world of the Monaco editor. While well, you run this code and you will see this editor on your, on your right, right? So of course, first thing first is we're gonna install Monaco editor at this version. I try close. Let's try and run this. Okay, now it's installed. Let's uh run. Let's start back our dev server and let's come here and try and create this editor, right? So here I have my page. Um, just remove everything. Um, so first it's gonna come back to my playground. This is the basic code, right? So here, um. Oops. If you look at, focus on the code a bit, it says that you import Monaco and then you create out of the, some elements and then with this, it will create this editor. So let's, let's try and see whether we can copy this and make this work. Um, so in my component, I'm gonna have a, uh, copy this one, right? And I will need to import Monaco from somewhere. I guess import Monaco from Monaco editor. Right, and then I need the reference of this element, which I can get it, like say, I create a div. I'm gonna bind this div uh, to an element, a uh, container. Let's container equal Okay, and this will be the container. Save this. Let's let's come back and see what do we have. Okay, we have some server errors, 
And that is because um uh in Svelte Kids by default we do server side rendering, right? And um we do server side rendering, so this page itself if you want to render on server, uh Monaco itself will introduce a lot of other things to make this works and it seems like it's not doesn't work well with server side. So I'm gonna come here. It'll create a p file called plus page dot ts, uh, and export let ssi equals true, is false. So tell file kit that this page itself, um, is we don't need ssr. We don't need server side rendering. Okay, so I can refresh this page. Uh, hopefully, see whether it's better now. Hopefully, if I refresh this page, uh, it doesn't create error. But it still have some sort of error, although it's not showing up in server anymore. Um, so I believe probably it's it's this code over here. Um, most likely the container it's not defined yet. I'm gonna import on mount. Like this. Okay. And then let's refresh and see whether it works. No. Not working. Let me see what's in our console. Let's see what we've missed over here. Oh, okay. Seems like Monaco. It's it's not exported from the Monaco editor. Is it? Is that so? Um. Probably something like this, I guess. Let's see. Okay, I think it, it's. I can see something, but it's not fully working. Uh, most likely because this div. Let's see. If I try to create. W with hundred percent. Okay, hundred. B W height. The BH, right? And maybe my body and my HTML has no padding and no margin. Save this. Let's come back. And we have our code editor over here, right? Basically, uh, although there's a lot of errors, uh, which we'll resolve later on, but. Uh, as you can see, we have our code editor now working by just this few line of code. So we've managed to get this code editor working with just these few lines of code, right? So now the next thing is we need to figure out some of the errors that we just saw in um in our console, right? These errors, and also figure out how do we actually able to figure whether if there's any type errors in our editor um, so that later on when we build our event of type script uh, play uh, the, that website we able to uh, figure out whether the tests have passed or there are some um, errors within our editor right so there's two things we need to do here right one is to figure out these errors second is to figure out whether we can get the type errors from the editor so first thing first, I'm going to figure out the first thing, which is to um, figure out the errors over here. Okay, so I've, of course, did some of my homework before I started this video. So um, I have found that um, if you, you, one thing you could do is to Google on this one to figure out what uh, you need to do over here, like um, how to set up the workers um, um, for VS Code which is basically something that you need um, so that um, so that it, it, uh, uh, the Monaco is able to load a, like some of the editor features through workers. Okay, so this is something you have to define. Um, and one quick way to learn that actually is uh, from the Monaco editor. Um, this is the source code. Uh, this is a readme file and it actually provides these uh, examples 
let's see where's the yeah examples complete examples and here um since we're using spell kit which uses vids i'm gonna find one example that uses vids apparently the closest one that i find is browser esm vids react um probably is good enough for some configurations let's take a look um so here i in my source um Actually, I've been here before. Uh, I, I know what I'm looking for. What I need is user worker, which is this file, which defines self.monaco environment, which is exactly this thing. Monaco that Monaco environment that get worker URL, right? So this is or get worker, right? So this exactly defines what I need. So what we do here is going to copy all this. Copy. And I'm going to come back to my code and I'm going to paste this in somewhere. Let me think where I should put it. I think I'm going to create a folder right now. For now, I'm going to move all the Monaco related code into this folder called Monaco slash um, index.ts. Oops, sorry. This should be a file instead of folder. Let me create a file instead, index.ts. All right, so I import all this. And let's see, actually, I don't need all of this, right? I don't need HTML, CSS, JSON. I don't need them. I need probably this too. For now, good enough, because that's all uh, we're going to write is TypeScript or, yeah, just TypeScript. Okay, so this is the setup. And, um, and okay, I think that's, that's it. I just need to import this. So where I should go is come here to my code. I am going to import Monaco. Import this lib slash Monaco slash index. Okay, so let's save this. And if I refresh, you can see that all the errors is gone. Um, because we have defined the get worker correctly and I don't think we feel any significant difference over here but I I guess some sort of workers or something like um, editor experience thing that is happening behind the scenes uh, this gives us some hinting uh, which I believe if we don't do this let's refresh uh, hover over the code um, gets us nothing okay so we probably just able to see the editor able to come here and make changes but anything that involves the language server which is the back um, some service that runs behind the screens behind the scenes to gives you um, some hinting some completion overlays and all these things are not available without the worker, right? So here, if you hover, uh, even if you try to make changes, I think there's some basics highlighting, but you can't um, give any hints by hovering or typing anything, okay? So this only gives us alert. Um, but if now we turn on this, and this should give us the uh, setup basic editor worker and TS worker, now with this let's refresh with this gives us more things like uh typescript autocomplete um gives gives us um all the different type definitions and stuff like that okay right so we've done with one thing which enables allows us to remove all the errors and also give us some type hinting now the next thing is to figure out how to know whether if there's any errors that's happening within our code um, to do that, um, I think we need to uh, come back, set up um, over here to our editor. And then um, we we need to take a few steps back. Let's see. Come back to our components. Right. So the first thing is we have our editor and we have the value, which is the string. Right. So this is the most basic way of creating an editor, which is to... Um, uh, create the editor directly on an element with some default value that you specify and then um, and then that's it right but um, if you want to do more things like to try to get uh, 
try to figure out like the 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 code over here and get some um setting some hints or make some interactions with it like listens to changes and stuff like that uh what you need to know is a few concepts um or met models that is available in in this monaco editor right so if you come back to the, the monaco uh the readme file you'll notice that there's a few concepts you need to know first is that everything is models models are at the heart of monaco editor so what is a model model is basically a concept that is um um something that that represents the file that you have right so it's like it, it encapsulates the the content of the file so you, you can treat that you are editing one file and this is encapsulated within a model right and it gives you the access of the content also it ex gives you uh it holds um the it holds the content it holds the language of the content it tracks the edit history it tracks anything that you interact with the um with the content itself right so later on uh, when content change we actually need to add listeners to our models to actually listen to see whether anything has changed on the model itself um, next concept you need to learn is the uri so uri is like the resource identifiers universal resource identifiers and it's a way for us to refer to a model okay so you can of course get a reference of the model but you can also get the URL, uri that points to that model and the reason of why you have URIs is that um, you can you can think of it as your file location, your file path um, in this editor. And you can, um, in most cases, you can use um, the file protocol uh, as the base path to build up your uh, file path within uh, your editor. So you can actually have multiple file paths, multiple models, and you can switch between different uh you you can actually uh, build your own like tab right to switch between different models to display different models on this uh, editor itself and to refer to each of them you use uris and this is actually useful uh ur actually is actually useful if you know how to use them because um some workers like typescript will rely on this uri to find or to resolve files right so you can actually have uh, relative imports or um, absolute imports stuff like that and how do they how do you actually even have like relative imports within a web editor and how that works is that um, each model which is which is each file have its own uri and then you can resolve based on uri so your uri has can uh can re how do you resolve your relative to each other right and then once you have models and URIs, which is the underlying concept of what, um, like the model of this editor, then the next thing you need to know is that you have a concept called the editor, which is the UI of that shows uh, what is the content of the editor, right? So whatever you in, this is what is on the DOM, and all the things what this is what the users see, and anything you interact with it will uh, interact with it. It will reflect. It will make changes directly to the underlying model and whatever you make changes to the underlying model it reflects um, the states of it will reflect on to the editor itself okay so i think for now these are the few um, concepts that you need to know for now and now uh, after so now knowing this context uh, this this information let's come back and make some changes to our code Okay, so instead of going to uh, getting the container direct uh, with the value directly, I'm going to create a model. Okay, so for uh, here, I'm going to say model equals to, uh, let me see, let me read my notes. Okay, so first thing is you're going to create uh, a URI first. URI equals to monaco.uri parse and we have a path so i'm gonna say like something like user.ts okay and the model will be we're gonna create the model editor 
uh, with the code. So this is the initial code. And then we're gonna specify uh, the what is the language. So we're gonna use TypeScript and the URI, which is the path, file path. You can think of it as a file path. So this is the model. And now when we create our um, editor, we will not specify the value and whatsoever. We don't have to specify language as well, right? Uh, all we, I think we can remove everything first. So we create an editor based on the container. Okay, and then with my editor, I'm gonna set model equals to this model, right? So let's save this and let's go back and we can see that nothing has changed. Nothing much has changed so far. Everything is still the same. But what's next we can do is that we can actually add event listeners to listen to whether the use the model has any we have made any changes to the model. So model on the change content. You can say model dot um get content. I get see um can we get model get line content oh lines content get contents of all lines okay let's save this and let's Refresh. Okay, so this is um, models. And if we try to make some changes, you can see that there will be event listeners and we can get all the different lines there is um, by adding an event listeners on the, on the model itself, right? So here, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna see whether we can, um, uh, now we know that every keystrokes we can we we are able to know uh we are able to being notified when something has changed and next thing is we want to get um to see whether is there any type errors or yeah typescript errors and stuff like that right so here um let's move on next part is that we are going to need um to get the workers to get the let's let's hide here first so next thing you can get is uh, the worker, which is the un underlying TypeScript worker that runs in the background that does the checking and stuff like that in the background, right? So I'm gonna get this uh, TS worker and you can get it by calling monaco.languages.typescript.getTypescriptWorker. So this gives you a promise, you can wait for it. And this gives you a function and because this function gives you um, the uh, worker itself based on which model it is. So I'm going to pass in this URI. Then this gives me the uh, worker for, well, I think we need to await, gives me the worker for the specific file, right? So this is the file path, right? So this gives me the worker for this file. And what I need to do next is that I am going to um, call TS worker that gets semantic diagnostics. So once we get the worker, right, actually what we can do next is that we can get some semantic, we can get diagnostics, which is to basically give us some message or diagnostic message uh, about like the status of the file. So there's there's a few types of um, the diagnostics. There is semantic diagnostics and there's synthetic diagnostics. The difference is that um, my understanding of the difference is that once gives us any syntax errors and the semantic gives us any um, type errors, right? So um, that's that's my understanding, right? So so we probably need we we just probably try to print both and see what we get. Um, so here, console log, uh, semantic is this one, synthetic, 
is this one. And we probably need to pass in something, which is the file path. Um, so which will be this one. And semantic, synthetic. And I think each of them is promised. So we're going to await for both of them. Okay. And let's save this and let's try run. So now we have this hello world. And if I make, if I delete a bracket, you can see that uh, we have one synthetic uh, messages or diagnostics. It tells us that this, uh, this file, this, this line, uh, um, this file, this has this error. It starts at the 40 character, the 40th character, and yeah, gives us some message over here, right? Um, so here we fix it, we have no semantic or synthetic errors. Uh, but if we do something like this, then we know that uh, function cannot be used to add, right? Then we get some semantic errors over here. It says that uh, this errors. Plus cannot be applied to types, blah, blah, blah. And then you can see that even if you hover, you can also see all this. So this message, this, this diagnostic message is a semantic diagnostics. And you can actually print it um, from the console, right? So this over here, uh, we basically listens to whenever the model has changed. And then we try to get the TS worker, the TypeScript worker, and then try to use the TypeScript worker to get the diagnostics of the file that we are interested in and I can print that out, right? So here, what we need to do next later on is basically see whether the length of like the array, right? This, this two returns a list of diagnostics, which is an array. And we can check whether if the array is empty, both arrays are empty, means there's no errors. If any of the arrays have, like, have any values, then I guess there is some type errors or could be syntax errors. And so basically this is how we are going to use to get the, uh, to know whether there's any errors happening within our, um, our editor, right? So that is, uh, and that's, I, I think I conclude that for our proof of concept, we know that this is doable. We can come over here and, uh, write some code and then we can uh, we can use Monaco to basically build this editor for us and then we can also listen to this editor and see whether if there's any type errors and that allows us to display the error at the bottom to see whether all tests has passed or there are certain tests that is not uh, or there's some errors and you have to fix it, right? I think the rough idea is there. So now uh, I, I conclude it's good enough for us to actually go up and actually build the event of TypeScript clones which includes the full layout and like the description and like the question itself and the error and stuff. So before we jump in and make the changes, one thing I want to do first is that I'm going to copy all this thing that we have from the routes and I'm going to move it somewhere like here first. Okay. Um, call on Monaco as felt. The reason is that because so that I can reset whatever is over here in my roots. Okay, so this is the home page. So everything in the um in the roots folder is back to um square one is resetted, right? So this is this is the original state. And now I guess it's time. Let's install some of the dependencies we needed to build our website, okay? To build our advent of TypeScript clone. The first thing I need is um, Tailwind um, because I think it's much easier that we add some of the style and classes uh, from Tailwind um, so that we don't have to think about what is the value, what is the unit, what is the specific style, styles and stuff like that. Um, I think there's a lot of things that I can just copy from Tailwind directly. So the first thing is let's initialize Tailwind. I'm gonna install Tailwind CSS. Okay, so here I am going to run that in my terminal. Let's kill this dev server. I'm going to install Tailwind CSS. And once that's... Okay, framework guides. I think what we need is for the spell kit one. 
Uh, I also need post CSS and auto prefixer. Let's let's install those as well. Okay, that's done. And then we're gonna initialize our Tailwind CSS. Okay, that should create some of the configuration files needed for Tailwind. And next thing is we're gonna configure for Svelte. Uh, I'm gonna use the vid processor. I think this is probably done. Let's let's take a look. Uh, this is already, we are already using vid processor, so this is it's okay, we don't have to do this. And we're going to come over to tailwindconfig.js to configure this part, the contents. Okay. Um, so let's save this. And next, we're going to create a file called appcss, that is this one, that has this content. So I'm going to go to source app dot css gonna paste this in and so this will initialize some of the tailwind um, directives some of the tailwind classes and resets some of the styles that is from the browser so that it normalizes so that everyone can see the base the same base and here in my source layout file i'm going to create this file and put this in so so that this css applies to all um to all the routes out there, they always have this uh, roots, uh, the, the reset CSS, the app CSS. And I think that's all. So we can start run now. Okay, uh, let's get back to our dev server right here. But now we actually have our Tailwind CSS set up and we're gonna use Tailwind later on. So with Tailwind set up, uh, next thing we're gonna do is that we are going to start with the layouts, okay? So for the layouts, I'm gonna create, um, as you can see, everyone of TypeScript, we have left and right with a resizer. And then on the right side, we have top and bottom with another resizer. So first thing is we're gonna create this left, right panel um, with like some sort of nav bar and like this, this whole layout thing, right? So uh, let me write, um, so that, I think first thing is that the layout itself for whatever pages we have, we probably will have that top bar. So that will be going into our layouts file. Um, let, let me come back to our layouts over here. I'm gonna add that. So first is we have our nav bar. Um, I'm gonna call advent of types script. You know what? I'm gonna have this on my right and have this on my left so you can see the changes on the fly as we type so this is the event of typescript and uh for this we are going to have some uh, padding px4 on the left and right and then maybe we're gonna have a uh, fixed height so the 300 pixel oh no 30 pixel and then we have uh flex so that we can put the content here. Uh, later on, we're gonna add more. Uh, without the title, we're gonna add, maybe we can think of adding um, the links and stuff like that. So here we set a line center, right? Um, item, so that it, it looks nice over here. Um, okay, so next thing is we are going to have the content, the slot content. Right, so the slots content over here right now we have is home page, but later on we're gonna have what? Let's see, uh, we are going to have some. Uh, a meeting. Okay, I think first is we're gonna define some URLs, right? So the home page that you're gonna let me open a file. The home page that you are gonna see, um, starts with the URL like home page, right? So this is gonna be the home page, and then for each of the pages we're gonna have. Uh, homepage will show us a list of challenges, and then if you click into one of the challenges, you should go to the uh, the challenges page, the challenge itself, right? So the, for the challenge itself, I'm, I'm think it should be having a URL that looks like this, where uh, one, two, three. So this is the challenge page, challenge details page. All right, so this is this is how I think the um the different URLs that we're gonna available for our Evan of Types, uh, Evan of TypeScript. Okay, so here, uh, it basically follows how Type Hero, 
uh, the Evernote TypeScript, the original one, right? So the home page looks like this, right? So it's it's the slash, and then this is the slash dot day, uh, two, and we have the Evernote TypeScript, which is AOT two zero two three. So I think we can have this as the AOT landing page, right? So whichever page we goes to, the title, the nav bar stays there, stays the same, right? Okay. So uh, we're gonna have these three routes. So we're gonna create. Um, so we we have decided to have these three routes. So we're gonna create the relevant uh, spell components to render each of this page, right? So um, the way you do it is is you come over here and create a file called uh, plus page dot right? So you create this component will be used to render the home page. This component will be used to render the AO landing page. This component will render the change challenge details page. So we're gonna create this field, uh, this this component. So the first one is this one, which we already have. Okay. Next one is the AOT two zero two three page Okay. Uh, so we're gonna of type script landing page and then we are going to have the challenge details page so new file and because the one two three is actually dynamic right so for dynamic parts i'm going to use the page parameters so here i'm going to call it the id so this gives us a challenge id with the name id uh, so we'll create this file and this will be the challenge page right so here um, let's, I'm going to create this, a um, challenge page. Okay. So, uh, now what we need is we're going to come over to the challenge page, uh, challenge five. Okay. So this is a challenge page and we're going to have some layouts over here. So for this one, uh, what we need is that we are going to have a, um, we're going to have the content, uh, to be full height, right? So something like, let me show you how, what I mean. So here later on, we, because, uh, for this challenge page like this, uh, we want to have the content to be full height and then inner contents to be able to be scrollable. Right, something like this. Okay, so we need first of all, you see the layout can be left, right, or top down, and all of we always want to fill up the full, and we don't want the page to be scrollable. Right, so this div, the container of the challenge page, has to be on a height that is just, just nice, which is like the height of the screen minus the height of the nav bar. Okay, so we know that our nav bar. Over here is 30 pixel. So here, uh, our height should be uh, calculate uh, 100 VH minus 30 pixel. Okay, uh, you probably can't see the background first. So let me uh, color it like something like a slate color, slate 300. So now you see that this is the exact height. Right, irrelevant of, uh, it doesn't matter of what's the resize. This is basically the height, and we're gonna have, and we having it as a fixed height later on makes it easy for us to lay out where the content can be hundred percent of height and hundred percent of width. So this, the content, the width and the height of this container is very important for us. Okay, so after having a fixed container, um, with a specific height and width. I think width we still we should say it's hundred percent. So this is the full width. Um, this gives us the background again. I think let's put back the background. You can see that this is full width, right? Uh, having this next thing is that we want the left and right panel, right? Um, so it should be layout left and then right. Um, and the size of it is that we can resize, right? Once we resize, uh, the other one. Let's imagine like we're gonna resize the left one, like increase the or decrease the width. Then the right one should grow and shrink to fill the the void, right? The the remaining space. And basically that is a layout where we can use flex to allow us to do it. The flex layout basically allows us to flexibly 
like grow and shrink uh content that is like uh based on the remaining space of uh of the whole the container right so i'm gonna make this container a flex container and it should be a flex row because um because we we flex on on the left right right and i'm gonna give like some padding uh p for now okay so with the padding, uh, okay. So now we're gonna have two content, right? One is the, um, the left side, and another one is the right side, right? So left is the description, right side is the editor. So now, uh, <laughs> I mean, on the screen it looks like this. Nothing, nothing much interesting. Um, uh, to 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 see the to see both div. To know like their boundary, I'm gonna paint it like background to be uh one is red, another I'm gonna paint it green so that you can obviously see. Okay, maybe you can't see red and green. I guess maybe I will put one as uh, a darker green. Okay. Right, one is a light red, one is a darker green. If you can't see the difference between red and green, I guess you can see based on one is lighter, one is um, darker. So this is the, uh, right now, the left and right. Um, so we have already have full height, right? And then now the left, right itself is, uh, no one is taking up the full space, right? So I would, I'm going to say that the on the right hand side, this should take up the full width. Um, I'm gonna call it a uh, flex one, right? So this will take up the remaining space, and then from the left side, uh, what we I'm gonna do is then I'm gonna define a um, variable. So I'm gonna use the width width. So this width right now is 100, and if we increase this like to 500, this will be how it looks like, right? So whatever the width itself, um, this should give us the, uh, the right side should take up the remaining space, okay? Um, so for this one, I'm gonna use runes instead of normal. Uh, Like instead of the old spelled for kind of syntax. So this one uh, will be a variable later on. So I'm gonna say state 300. Okay, um, nothing changed yet, but basically we're gonna say this is the state rune. This gives us a state variable and we're gonna use this later on to, um, uh, in, in our code, we're gonna use this, gonna change this later on. So now, uh, once we, we, we have set this width, um, let's see what's next. Okay, what's next is that uh, if you see here, you can expand a bit, you can see here that there is this uh, one more element on the middle in between the left and the right. And this gives us um, a cursor that looks like you can resize and it does able to allow you to resize um, uh, to drag left and right to resize the left and right panel. Okay, so we're gonna create that uh, element. So it will be in between the the left and the right over here. So we're gonna call this a div. I mean, we're gonna create a div for this. And within a div, we are, um, let's to see this div, I'm gonna put the background to be uh, maybe yellow. 500. Okay, you can't see the div because it has no content. I'm gonna give the width uh, a fixed width. I'm gonna say uh, three pixels, right? So you now you see this width. Okay, this this div, and um, I'm gonna create another div. Uh, that's basically this thing, right? This this something in the middle that lets you feel like you are resizing something, right? This this thing where it hovered. Uh, it it changed its color or it it lights up as you hover onto the the whole div. 
and it's like a handle where you can grab, right? So I'm gonna create a div for that. Um, this one, uh, I think the width will be just one, and um, and I guess the height can be something um bigger. I guess I don't know, sixty pixel. Let's try and see and see what what we get. Uh, let's save this. Okay, we don't have a color yet, right? So we're gonna call this. Uh, give a background like zinc color, two hundred. Okay. Oh, okay. So you can see it over here, right? So this thing, uh, we are going to. Um, let's see. Uh, we are gonna cent center it, right? So to center this thing, um, uh, maybe the parents. What we can do is we're gonna use the, uh grid place place content center yep so this grid with place content center allows to put this on the center like over here all right so this is um and and okay i think i need to um so this one over here uh what you see just now is that when you hover over it your cursor will change to the resize cursor right so we can change our cursor to cursor call resize, right? So still on the parent. So whenever I hover, it's it's the uh, column resize cursor. And then uh, I need this to hover. It gives us a hover state where it, it changes its color, right? So uh, when it's, right now it's 200 zinc, but if it's hover, I'm gonna use background zinc uh, 400, okay? So let's save this. As you can see, if I hover, it changes the color. But if I hover on its on, on the parents or anywhere, it doesn't change the color. Right? It it feels a bit off. It should be that when I hover the whole thing, the whole thing is being uh changing the color, right? So in playwright, how I can do that is that you need to create a target group. You can set a group in its parent and say that when the parent specific like this group, when it's hover, then my child can target like, okay, if this is having a hover state, what I should do, right? So to do that in, in Playwright, actually what you can do is that, so this is the, uh, this is, this is the, this is the whole thing, right? This is the parent. I can create a, I can add a class called group. And then over here, instead of the hover myself, is the group that is being hover. So I say group dash hover. Now, if I save this, you can see that if I hover on the group, the, the inner content also have this hover state and, and light up, right? So of course, we're not going to add a hover class on the parent because we want to change the color of the children, right? But you want the hover on the parent and then changing style on the children. So parent, you set a group and then children say for that group, if it's hover, I want to change, uh, I want to have a change of the class. I will unspecify this class, right? So this is the group hover modifier. And then I have the background zinc like 400. Right, so uh, yeah, so that's the effect you get. Uh, let me just remove this background yellow. It's ugly, and we don't need to know what is it anymore. But now you see, it looks quite nice. Except that I think uh, it lacks a bit of um, like natural feel of it. Like if you try to hover over here, you can feel that the it lights up, and when you move away, it slowly glows away. Right, so I think we need to add some transition uh, with the with the color changing. So we're gonna say the transition um, colors, uh, and I'm gonna uh, add duration to be maybe five hundred millisecond, which is half a second. And let's see, right? So it it slowly turns into gray, and then when I move away, it slowly turns back to the original color, right? I think it feels more natural now. Okay, so this is basically. Uh, Right, the hover. Uh, if I look closely, I think one more thing it, it feels weird is that it it is square, right? It it that's that's why it feels a bit, um, you know, like the minimalistic kind of feel. By I'm thinking adding some round corner, like I'm gonna call it rounded. Right now, it it's the handle itself is more natural to hold on to right okay i guess it's it's more closer to this the one we see on Evernote of typescript right 
um, yeah, although it changed to blue, but I think changing to a darker zinc color, it's okay. Right, so now we have our left and right. Now, next thing is we need to be able to uh, resize. Right, and, and basically resizing is to actually just change uh, the width uh, value, right? Increase or decrease the value of width. Um, then hopefully the right side is, because we put flex one, it will grow and shrink accordingly. Right, so here, um, to change it, I think one thing we need to do is to add the um, mouse down event listener on the parent. So we can, any time, any point of time when it, on our mouse down over here on our parent, we're going to listen to it and then we're going to uh, see how much uh, we move as our move, mouse move and then record the differences, uh, the distance that we've traveled and then use that to calculate how much width, what should be the width uh yeah what what should be the width of the of the left panel and uh, until we lift our mouse up right which is in the mouse up event so first thing is we need to listen to mouse down right when we press on this so i'm gonna say uh, on mouse down and then we have the resize mouse down event Okay, so in this event, uh, one thing that we can get, um, hold on, let me, uh, what is this? Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, I think we need to add length equals to TS. Right, so this is a mouse event. Uh, event dot uh, client X. Right, so this is where we click on uh, like the the X position of where we click on so we're gonna store this variable somewhere like I'm gonna call it this is initial X uh, as number okay, we're gonna store this number and then later on um, once we press on it and as we move around we're gonna know we're gonna listen to the mouse move event and then until we move we, we release our mouse, which is the mouse up event, right? So we're going to listen to two more two events whenever we're going to start listening to two events when we press on the resize element, right? That, that element, right? That, that resizer, right? So once browse down is down, we're going to listen to two more events. Um, so that would be the um, document at the event listener, uh, mouse move. Mouse move event, call it resize mouse move. Uh, and also mouse up event. Uh, event mouse up. Okay, so for this one, uh, for this two, for this two, uh, let's see. For this two, I'm gonna say, I'm going to define this two function first, right? So let me copy this. I think we can define it over here if we want. It's okay. This is the mouse move. This is mouse up, right? I think the we can have this over here. This, okay. So mouse up is, is simple. Uh, we just say that we're going to remove these two listeners once we lifted our mouse. Remove event listener and mouse move is the one that we need to use to calculate uh, where how much we have moved, right? So here um, we're gonna say let a um, okay, first off is that we're gonna know how much we have traveled so far. So delta x equals to event client x minus the initial x. So basically, once we mouse down. We record the X position and as we move, we're going to get the new position and then that is how much we have traveled so far. And I think we can also record the initial width. So this basically depends on what's our initial width. Uh, so if we move like 10 pixels to the left, then the width 
the new width should be the initial width minus 10 pixel, right? So we're going to record down the value of the width. Then uh, over here, uh, we're going to say the width is equals to uh, event dot, uh, sorry, the initial width plus the delta x. Yep, I think that's it. So let's try. So we're going to move. Okay. And, and that's it, right? So basically, uh, as you can see, as we move our mouse, you can see that um, we we get the we records down the to this we can set as cons record down the initial x and the width value, and then as we move, we just uh, see how much we travel, and then the width should be based on uh, the initial width and plus the difference that we've traveled so far from the initial one, right? So that's, that's, that's the resize. Okay. And that's, that's it for this one. Um, we have got some accessibility complaints that div shouldn't have some, should have mouse down. I think we can change this to button. Shouldn't be a problem because it looks like it, it should be a button where you can press on and then you can do some interactions with it. Right, so, uh, ah, okay, with spell five, I guess we can use on mouse down instead. Yep, still still works fine. Um, now, so one thing you might be curious about why I add event listeners to mouse move down, mouse move and mouse up on the document instead of the button itself, right? And the reason is because that uh, when one when we move, if we move too fast away from the button, right? If we let just move away, uh, before the button being moved together with us, uh, what will happen is that um, uh, my so the mouse mouse move event itself, right? Uh, if we listen on the button itself, the the movement of the mouse has to be on the button itself. So if we move too fast or move away from the button before we have the button to move, to shift the button to below where our cursor is, uh, any movement from there on, you actually are not being notified or registered to the button. Right? And it's the same where if you move to move out of it and then tries to, um, you, like you move out of it and then like if you, your cursor is here, but the button is here and you raise, you lift up your button, uh, your mouse, uh, the button itself is not gonna register the mouse up event because you're not re you're not releasing your mouse on the button, right? When when your cursor is on the button, you're not releasing your mouse there. So you you can't listen. You if you listen from there, you can't get it. But uh, if you listen to the document on on the whole, then you actually can listen to mouse move and mouse up. Uh, no matter how like what are the tricks that you move your mouse around or lift out your mouse. Uh, that will still be able to be registered. Okay, so that that is about it. Um, so once we have this left, right, I think next thing is we want to uh, also move next is come to the right side of the editor and then create like top down, right? So I think we're just going to copy this again, uh, something similar like here and here. Uh, this is the height equal state 300. Okay. Um, so the, this is the right top side, right top and right bottom. Okay, the top gets some color like a blue, and then this gives us yellow. Blue 100, yellow 900. Right, and then this one's, um, now you see that it's not full. Uh, right has a fixed height, so it, it takes up so much space, but the right bottom is not take up the full one because it didn't apply like a flex one. Um, 
but its parent also doesn't give like a flex layout so flex one has no meaning at all so the the parent the left the right parent should should start a new flex layout container so i'm going to say flex and by default flex is left right so this is how you see uh, but what we need is the flex uh, column which is the column direction uh, flex direction as column so that it's top down so you can see that this right now have right and top like this okay so same thing we're going to create a button over here um, that gives us uh, instead of width a fixed width we're going to have the fixed height 3 pixel height and same thing this is the height with 1 pixel and width with 60 pixel uh, so now it looks like this right uh, we can remove the color uh, from the parent now we don't need the background green to know what region it is so it looks something like this okay but this one should have the cursor of um, should have the cursor of where's my cursor oh, row resizer so when I save this this gives us like this and now we need also to create a resize mouse down uh, but I wonder whether we can just reuse this function again but like define it such that we can uh, have a variable called like a width that we don't have to um, that we can reuse for resizing left right and also resizing uh, resizing top down right so here what we're going to do next is let's see whether we can uh, create a function that gives us a state like a a, a yeah a variable like a state and then uh, that we can use on the layout so then we can reuse this uh, resize um, so then we can reuse this resize uh, event like the, the logic the whole logic over here itself right so I'm gonna define a function first. Um, I'm gonna do that in a okay. I'm gonna do it just directly in this component over here. I'll call it get resize, get resize, and um, and basically I'm gonna copy this whole thing over here, right? Uh, and I'm gonna return the width. Um, it will be a getter of the width uh, because we just need to get the width value we don't need to set the width value so we just return the getter uh, the getter the width getter and I think what we also need is to return this resize mouse down function so that we can actually use it from the outside and resize I think one thing we probably need is to get uh, the direction okay so if the direction is x and y, a uh, direction will be either x or y. Okay, so x means we're gonna get like initial x value, use all this as the x value, right? And if it's y, then all of this will be the initial y value, right? So here I'm gonna rename this such that it's uh, direction x and agnostic initial value i guess and then this one is the initial sorry uh initial cursor value cursor position and this one gives us the initial initial value all right so uh here this should be the value uh Got value, I guess. Okay, value. And then, okay, this one, this over here has to be uh, client x, right? Okay, delta is the same, delta. So only this one, right? Okay, this is the uh, direction specific. So I'm gonna create a variable call, uh, proper event property name from direction um, so if this should be actually be something like client x right so it's something like client 
with the direction to uppercase. Okay. Maybe it's a bit confusing. I think writing it this way bet will be better. Direction equals to x equals to client x uh or direction um, how about this one? Uh equals to x is the client x uh, y is client y and then this gives us the direction okay right so this is the uh pop uh, pop name property name okay so this one i'm going to use it here instead like this This one uh as cons. Sorry, no. Uh as client X or client Y. Right, so hmm, I think this one if it's as cons should give us the Yeah, something like this. So we sort of refactor a bit to remove like direction specific, uh, direction specific variable names, and I guess this get resize, uh, gives us the uh, value and a getter of the value and also the uh, event listeners to resize. Right. So uh, I'm gonna remove this one. And now I'm gonna say uh with resizer equals to get resizer get resize uh x and cons uh, height resize equals to get resize y. So what I'm gonna do here is basically I, I slide refactor right um and uh but what I managed to do is to create a function that returns the states as well as give us the uh, resize event handlers that is specific to the direction. So I can call this function uh, multiple times to return multiple state var variables and also multiple event listeners that I can use that as that the event listeners is specific to the value that we just get, right? So now with resize, we'll have the with resize dot value and also with resize dot uh, event listener, right? Resize mouse down. So this event listener will resize specifically for my with resize. And for the height, I guess I also have a height resize dot value. And this gives me the height resize dot resize mouse down, right? It's to resize the mouse down event. Uh, I resize the height value itself. Right? So it now this one, resize this and this resize this one right so with um uh with runes actually the code i just basically copy paste move it here do some variable rename and that's it we don't have to turn this variable into a uh, spell store or vice versa and i can reuse this anywhere right and i can even use this move this to um Another, another file and it will still work, right? Uh, nice thing is that I can still use the same syntax as like assigning. I don't have to change these parts. It's, it's still the same. I can still read and assign value the same way it was previously. It's written as the top as a top level variable or within, um, uh, within another function over here. Okay. So now uh, we have our resizer right um now i guess it's time that we can move on um to to adding our editor and also like add our editor will add both over here right i guess next thing is let's let's create some apis so that we can um load the data of this challenge um and to display them within um, the components over here. Now, obviously the next step is we are going to get the data 
um to to load the challenges the uh, the TypeScript code the setup uh, into our application right so uh, where do we get all this data from um I mean we can write those data ourselves or we can copy from Evan of Types script right um this the data it's, it's open source one thing of course the other thing is that uh, I mean this is um, for us to just have some basic setup we we of course we're not gonna steal the code we're gonna just use it for now uh, just to to work on our our clone right still we're just trying to learn uh, building the clone itself building the layout building the editor uh, I mean we can design the, the data later on but let's just copy the challenges so I've actually cloned the um, the source code for the type hero and this is the challenges for the Evan of TypeScript 2023. For now, I'm just gonna copy this and come over to my source over here. I'm gonna paste it into a folder called data. So we have data 2023 and all these challenges over here. Now, of course, now we need some APIs to give us all this data, right? So um, actually there's a multiple ways of doing it. Right now, we're gonna just hard code the data into our project and read directly through the file system. Um, another way you could do is that you could populate this data into some database and then you call the API to um, call the data, read from the database. Your API will read from the database and return from it, right? Um, there's multiple ways you can do, but having a source code within the source folder makes it much easier for us to develop locally to just uh, read from the file system and list what are all the files that is available. Um, so we, in this video, it much makes more sense for us so that we don't have to go through how to set up database for it. So now we have the data, the source, right? In each folder, you have some prompts, metadata, uh, markdown, prompt markdowns. And then you have the test. This is the source for the test file. And this is the source for the user. Uh, where the user will set this. I think this is the input where you will see on the right top right. And then this is the test that you will see on your bottom right. And then this is the prompt that you will see on the left side of the description. Okay, so we're going to create three of them. I mean, we're going to create an endpoint that returns three of them uh, based on which, uh, uh, based on the parameters, query parameters we're going to be available. All right, so, um, so we create endpoints to do those things, right? So we're gonna design where my endpoints will be. Uh, a convention that I'm gonna use is that all my endpoints will be under the API subfolder. And uh, because I know that uh, from the routes, we don't have API and API prefix with API makes us be clear that this is API that you can call, like a JSON API that you can call from your application. And in the API, uh, for now, I'm gonna have uh, maybe two endpoints. One is the challenges. So this gives us a list of challenges and maybe another one called API challenge slash maybe one, two, three. So this gives us the challenge, like the info for the challenge one, two, three. All right, so we're gonna create two endpoints. All right, so to create the endpoints, uh, similar to create a page component, uh, we create a special file called server.ts. Right, so I'm gonna create this two file um, in my source folder so that this will uh, create this endpoint, right? So the first one is the API challenges server. Okay, so this one, uh, we're gonna have a get endpoint. Right now I'm gonna return JSON response. And then we're going to create another endpoint called this one, API challenge one, two, three server.ts. Uh, so same thing, this is dynamic. So we're going to be a parameters. Same thing also, we are going to create exports, uh, async function, a get function. This gives us a 
the JSON response. Okay, so here, oh, this should be a capitalized get. So now we are going to visit uh, API slash challenge. API slash challenge. Sorry, challenge server.ts. Right? Come on. Did I typo anything? Oh, no. Hold on. This, serve, this API should be under the routes folder. And move it under here. Under the routes folder, challenge server. Hold on. This one is the challenges. API. Hold on, what did I get wrong? Let's see. Uh, let me think. Server.ts. Oh, hold on, hold on. Um, it has the plus symbol. I totally forgot about the plus symbol like this. All right, so it has to be a plus to be a special component, uh, file or component, right? So it has Plus server. So refresh this. This gives us okay, a JSON response with nothing written. Um, so for, of course we need to find the list of challenges, right? So here, um, I'm gonna import the file system. Uh, path. I'm gonna find the path and the file, uh, from the folder, right? Um, this gives us, okay, I think this one, we need to install the types node uh, from TypeScript. npm install types node. It gives us the type definition for this too. So first thing is for here, uh, what I need is to find, uh, to go to the folder, right? Folder equals to path.join uh, the current directory to the, where is it? Let's see, 1.2 dot, 1.2 dot, dot, um, I think three dots to the data folder. Uh, child data 2023, right? This should gives us the, the path to this folder. And then we need, uh, to read, uh, let me use the promise base. Read the folder. This gives us the challenges. And then we're gonna list all the challenges available. All right, so here, I'm gonna run. Refresh. Oh, this is the challenge, sorry. Challenges. Um, oh, their name is not defined. Um, I guess we have to define it. So, um, their name is equals to the path, their name of the file URL to path import meta. Okay. So this gives us one, right? This gives us a list of files, a uh, folders. Right, that is in the AOT folder. I think one thing is I want to sort this by by numbers. Okay, so um, I guess I can come over here and uh, sort uh, A, B based on the num numeric value itself. Right, so if alphabetical, this is correct because one, and then we have two. Right, uh, but now I want to sort it like numerically. So I'm gonna say A minus number B. Save this, refresh. Okay, this is correct. Um, but I want I don't want to just like having this. I want it to be like something like it gives me the uh the challenge, the the name itself and the URL. Right? So here uh the map the challenge. I guess this is the ID. The ID and then the URL. 
would be the slash challenge slash ID, something like this. Let's see. Right. So we sort it and then we map it to an object. So this is what we get. Right. This goes to this this page, right? This, which is correct. Um but I guess the ID itself, uh maybe something we can do more to the ID itself, because I feel like the ID, um the name itself it's it's um, could be better, right? Uh I'm not sure whether the Evernote TypeScript actually gives some name. I see there's the metadata. That's like a label and description. Right? Uh I guess what we can do is use the label as a name itself instead of the just the ID. So here what we can do is that we can um read it out, right? So um fs dot read file based on the folder the id and then meta data dot json but i guess this one this is a promise so we need to wait for it uh, so we need a sync function which means that this whole thing when it maps this whole thing is a promise so a, a array of promises so I think we need a promise dot all. Uh, we'll wait for it. So here we have read the file, the content, uh, the meta data equals pass. Okay, we have read the meta data, and with the meta data we can get. Read the meta data. We can get the label. So ID is ID, I guess we can get the name is the label, something like this. Let's refresh. So you get day one, hold on, day three, day two, day four. Maybe it's something wrong with the, the, the challenge itself, right? Let me see. Uh, okay, two is three and three is two. Okay, let me, let me quickly fix this. So this should be the two, three, this is two. Okay, so let's refresh. Uh, day one, day two, day three. Okay, so we have this API to list of list of challenges. Then I guess we also need API to get the specific challenge, like day five challenge, um, to read the contents of the challenge, right? So this one, um, I think it's not too hard now since we have basically this ID over here. Let's let's roughly copy here, and we're gonna create. We're gonna come here to paste it in. Right, so we have the folder. I think this one should have one more layer down because this is one more folder in. Then read the okay, then we need to uh read the challenge based on the parameters. So this should give us the parameters and this should give us the ID, right? Because we have specified ID over here as the parameters, so we can get this value out. Should be the part of the path where this is the folder over here like this, and next thing is that in each folder we can read the prompts, the test, the user dot ts, right? So, um, the file, the prompt, right? So path dot join folder, prompt, the md. I'm gonna read the the prompt, the test TS, and the user TS. Right, await for all of them. I'm gonna copy the name of the file over here like this. So JSON, this one will give us prompt, the test, the user. Like this one. I guess we can also read the metadata, right? Metadata. Parse it. Like this. 
refresh. So we get a prompt, the metadata, the prompt, the test, and the user. Right. So one thing is that the prompt is in Markdown. So later on when we display, the Markdowns probably will be um, not as useful or not as nice. We need to figure a way to turn this Markdown into some sort of HTML, right? Also, we just display this uh, in the HTML. We see like to to slash the uh, to hash sign. I mean, it there's no style. There's nothing. It doesn't look nice, right? So uh, one thing we can do here is that we can um, import a library to transform the Markdown into a into HTML, right? And that library is called uh, Mark. I think Mark. Uh, simple enough. It's just mark where we import mark, and then we can turn it. Where is it? We can use mark, and then we can parse, and then we can turn it into HTML. I think that's simple enough for our use case. So let's install mark. And here, uh, oops, hold on. We are gonna imp. Oh, did I type wrongly? So mark. Okay. So we have it now installed right in our mark. Let's import it. Uh, over here. And I'm going to use mark to turn the prompt into HTML. Let's see whether this works. Maybe I need uh, something like this. This returns a string of promise. I think let's just await. So this is a string. Okay. And let's try and let's try run back our server and let's refresh this now this is html right with h2 and all these things okay so now we have two endpoints one to give us a list of challenges like this one and another give us a specific information of the challenge the markdown the prompts the test the user okay so now with this data let's try to load them into our application Let's start with the page with the list of challenges, which is the AOT-2023. So here we have a list of challenges, right? So uh, we have to call our endpoints that we just make. Um, so we can actually load them in the load function of this page, which we can define in the page.ts. And you can export a function called load, which will be called uh, which will be the function that will be called whenever you visit a page when the spell kit will call this to load the data right so the data we need is uh, going to be called using the endpoint we're going to fetch it so the fetch function you can get it from the one in that is passed into a load function because this fetch is special this patch this fetch um, caches and allows you to call on both server side and client side and will cache the response so you don't have to refetch it again if you have already fetched it on the server side. So fetch, uh, I'm going to call the API slash, uh, hold on, let me see, API slash, what is the API? API slash challenges, right? So uh, response equals await the fetch and then response.json, this gives us a list of challenges. Right, and return the challenges in the object. So now with the challenges, we can get this in our props. And go to the, um, let's see, the components, which is the AOT2023. Here we can define our props. I'm gonna use the props runes. Uh, exp uh, let a equals to props. And oops, hold on. And then we are going to get the data, right? And I'm gonna spread uh 
look at the challenges from the data. Simon must not cont okay, hold on. Uh we'll get data for now. And we're gonna get the um data.challenges, right? Uh let's uh challenges equals to derive from here. Okay, with the challenges, we are going to um, list out, right? So we're gonna each challenges as challenge each. Um, so actually the challenge we have, remember we have the ID, name and URL. So we're gonna destructure that ID, name, URL. And then this is the list item with the, um, with the name and I guess we can create a href with the using the URL like this. Okay, which I don't need the ID. Uh, yep. And create a unordered list. Let's save this. Let's come over to the page itself. Right, so this is the AOT two zero two three. Yeah. Okay, so we have the list of challenges. Right. If you click into that, we can go to the challenge description page. So this is the list of challenges. So now of course it's it doesn't look that nice, but we can fix it up, right? We can create a uh maybe a title first, right? Um advent of type script 2023 let's save this um let's make the a text center align uh maybe put some margin top bottom and make the text extra large right okay and then unordered list uh first of all we're gonna make it grid and then grid maybe three by three columns calls three and then put some gap Right, then for each of the list item, uh, or the, we can have, um, let's see, a um, background color. Okay, um, for this one, I think I want the contents to be maybe 150 pixels and 150 pixel. Let's see. Um, oh, because, okay, so A, it's anchor tag, anchor element by default is a inline element. It doesn't have width and height, so I guess we need to make it like, uh, you cannot specify width and height, you can have turned it in a block element, then I guess that's, that's how it will take in width and height. So this one, um, I guess we need to... Um, how do I put the content? Okay, I think we can say the grid and place content center. Yep. So the text is in the middle. And then also here, I guess I can also place item center. Then it will be center align. Mm. Something like this. Place items a place content i guess we can place content center maybe that's better i guess front end hmm. Hmm. Let's see. Ah, I know. Uh, margin X auto. Is it? Hmm. What I want to try to achieve is so that all of them squeeze into the middle uh, of 
Okay, I think I know why. Because I don't have a fixed height. A fixed width. Right, so I can actually say um, 150, 150, so probably around 450 uh, plus some gap uh, with uh, 500 pixel. Right, then I guess the margin auto will allow me to uh, put the center itself. Right, so this is the list of challenges and now we can click into day two. And then we come here, which is the URL challenge two. And now we also need to have a load function to actually load the description and the test for for this day of challenge. Right. So let's go to that page. Right. So that will be a challenge page. Right. So here, same thing. We need the plus page dot ts and exports a load function. to allow us to load the data for that challenge, right? So here, uh, over here, we have params as well as the fetch function because we're going to get the ID from this page, params uh, dot ID. Um, this will be the challenge ID. And we're going to call fetch. Uh, API challenge slash with the challenge ID. And then we are going to wait for the JSON response. Um, let's see the challenge return challenge. Right, so here this load function will return, will call the fetch, uh, will call the API, will fetch the API and then get the response as challenge and then put this in the data.challenge. So here actually I can read it out. So here I'm going to say const um, data equals to props and data.challenge is what we're going to take. Right, so this one should give us um, the. This one should give us the, um, the the metadata, the metadata, the prompt, the prompt, the text, uh, the prompts, the users, scripts, and the a uh, sorry the the prompt, the user scripts, and the test scripts right so um uh then next thing is we need to figure out where to pass this thing right um i think right i'm thinking of uh keeping this page component simple i'm gonna rip i'm gonna move all of this into its own component inside the lib folder so we can work on that here right so i'm gonna create a folder called uh challenge A challenge a uh, file called challenge spelt. I'm gonna copy this over here and also copy this code over here like this. Okay, and I'm gonna import challenge from this file. And I am going to pass, I'm going to create this challenge. I'm going to pass a few things in. So first thing is the meta, the, uh, sorry. I think the description, I, I guess I will just pass the challenge directly like this. Challenge equals data dot challenge. So here in the props, we can define that over here, like data equals challenge, uh, sorry. Um, no, so the prompts we're going to get is the challenge, right? So I will just say challenge directly challenge equals to an object. Um, okay. Uh, what the challenge have challenge will have, let's see, um, over here, it will have metadata prompts, tests, and user. 
Okay, so for now, I'm ignoring metadata. I'm not quite sure how we're going to use it, but prompt test data, they're all strings. So I'm going to say prompt is string metadata, oh, sorry, user is string and test is string as well. So I'm going to get challenge. I'm going to get prompt user test. Okay, um, probably I need to derive them later on. Um, so let's 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 stick like this. There should be a string. Um, pom equals to derive challenge dot prom. I get prompt, I get user, I get test. Okay, so prompt user test. And well, I'm going to put my prompt somewhere around here, right? So I'm going to use HTML because this will give us all everything in HTML. And for a user, uh, for now, I'm going to put it here first. And for the this one, bottom right, this is where I'm going to put the test. Let's save this and let's take a look. Let's close all of this. Right, basically, yes, everyone is in where they should be. Um, so I guess now we can take a bit of time to um to style our code a bit up right so here uh in the challenge um it looks a bit simple right now but let's let's um uh, style it up first thing is we probably don't need to know the color anymore right let's remove the color but we are gonna have a um some border and and some background color right so first thing is background color i'm gonna put zinc 200 um border is i am going to write um let's see zinc 500 um and then a i'm gonna make it round rounded and then mm, i guess the round probably should be bigger round xl okay it looks and then some padding of course padding padding would be four no, I guess too much. Two. Okay. And let's see. Padding two. Okay. I guess next thing is probably we can have some another uh a I guess you see this this overflow this this probably don't look good. Uh we probably need a place for it to scroll. And over here, I another thing is I need to create a, a tit title for this, right? So here I'm gonna have the description as the title, and then here is where I can scroll. So this is where overflow uh, y auto. This is where I can allow it to scroll. Ah, uh, okay. I, I guess I need to set some width and height so that. It will overflow and then you will scroll. So first thing is um I'm gonna make I'm gonna use a flex to lay this lay out this one, right? The type description and and, and the uh, bottom part. So uh first is I'm gonna say this is flex with flex column this. Uh yeah, so now this can scroll now, right? Um yeah. I guess we just add flex and flex column. This by itself can scroll, but I guess the scroll bar appears here a bit weird. Uh, let me remove the padding uh, from the container, but we put it into its uh, its children. P2 over here, P2 over here. Let's save this, right? So it looks something like this. And then if I resize, you can scroll like this. Yep, I think it looks better. It's just that the title, maybe we have a different color. Right, so here background I guess zinc three hundred. 
Uh, but oh, okay. So I I guess the then, uh, with this it seems like we'll cut rectangle again, because the the parent itself has rounded corners, but the children does not. So actually, what we can do is the parent after having a rounded corner, we can have overflow hidden. So anything of its children, um, that is not rounded, it will be hidden. So this is the description. Um, let's uh maybe we add some border. Uh, let's see border border ah. I think one thing we added border, but it doesn't show up. I guess we need to add border like this, and then also border bottom. Like this, and then border, bo same color, zinc five hundred. Okay, so it looks nicer now, I guess. Hmm. Okay, so this is this is cool now, All right? We can resize. We can resize any way we want. Uh, okay. Now. Okay, it looks good. So now the next thing is we need this too as the editor, right? So we need to add the import editor back, right? So previously we have this editor that we set up using the Monaco. Um, I think we can throw dump everything here so that it's, I guess it's all in one. Uh, first is we're gonna have two div that is gonna be a container. So first is we have, let's see, the this is where the user code is. I guess this is where we can have uh, div um, bind this to be the user container or user, yeah, user editor container. And here is for the test container. I'm gonna create two variables for here. So let's this one state. Okay, and then in on mount. This is where we can set things up. So on mount. Mm, so we're going to have the user. We're going to copy this and, but we're going to change a little bit. Right, so here we have this code over here. Um, let's see. Uh, we're gonna import Monaco first. So we're gonna import this, right? And this. So there's two states. And I guess each of these has a file path, so we're gonna define a variable for that as well. User uh, you user file path equals this one. And the test file path is equals to this one. So user over here, we we'll call this a user URI. This is the user model. So the initial value of the user model, of course, it comes from this one. Uh, and then editor is the user editor. Uh, will based on the user editor container. I guess we can define uh, type HTML element. Like this. So assume it's, it's defined. Um, then user editor set this model. And then on change, let's ignore first for now. And we're going to copy this to set up the, the test. And this is the test path. This is the test code. Test URI. Okay. 
test container and then test editor set the test model okay so we have set up i guess we got some errors let's see what is that so uh let's refresh again ah okay same thing um we can't render this on the server side so we need to disable server side rendering over here okay so now we have something over here you can see a little bit of editor but it's not full um but you can sun you can't see it clearly so um what we need is that this diff actually needs to have a full height and width w full h full let's save this and let's refresh you can finally see the editor like this whoa okay so um i guess we can remove any background color like this one because we don't need them anymore save this so uh, let's refresh again so here we have uh we have this okay seems like our resizing doesn't work anymore and then uh this sort of doesn't really work well as well um so what happened i guess when we uh once we created the uh, the editor right once we have the editor uh once the height is the width and height is set up seems like it can't uh we can't resize we can't squish it and this height cannot push it over so what i'm going to do is that i think we need to set something like a um, overflow hidden somewhere in this editor so that we can force um uh so that it doesn't we don't really so that it can resize i guess now the reason is that i guess like if this has certain width and then it's forced a minimum width uh this editor has certain width and force a certain minimum width of its container then uh even we said with flex one we probably can't resize ourselves to reduce uh, ourselves now um so maybe i've set it to overflow hidden with um uh which means i don't uh i don't allow my whether my inner content like grow in size probably it will uh be just hidden away like when i when i'm resized to become smaller i think something like that maybe you can try and see whether it works so um let's try and add it to the um, to the container over here let's see the height um like this one, right? Save this. Yeah, see it works now. And now, basically now this part itself, the editor itself now is being hidden inside my parent content. Now my parent content can be any size and it's hidden inside, right? So, um. So what I need to do now is that um, is let's see, let me think. Okay. Now I think what we need to do now is then make sure that whenever we resize the container uh we are able to also force the uh editor to be resized as well right it's called a auto layout and actually we can do that when we create an editor over here right we can actually pass a option called uh lay automatic layouts equals to true like this save this refresh let's see whether that works right so let's auto layout so you can see that uh the width although like the con parent container resize and it will also resize accordingly as well so okay um i think one thing we probably can do is to improve a bit on the 
left side, the layout. Um, right now, it looks like this. Uh, but actually what I want is that I want to have like some sort of header that says this is the code. And then the footer that says like whether how many, whether the test is pass or fail. Right, so here uh, I am going to uh, come over here to my flex. Uh, this is the this is the editor. I'm gonna add a header. Um, so probably copy something like this one and pass it in over here. I'm gonna say this is the code. Save this. Right. So it looks something like this. And then maybe have same thing also at the bottom. Uh, border top instead of border bottom. And uh, result, save this. And then in the parent, I guess what we need also similar to here, where we have some rounded Excel border, rounded Excel, right? Some rounded corners and some borders. Let's add it in here. Save this. Okay. Okay, it looks looks good. So we can resize. We can resize this. Hmm, something is a bit off when I try to resize this. Um Refresh again. Seems like it doesn't go down, but it can go. Hmm. Kind of go up, is it? Uh, let's inspect if there's any errors. Let's see. So console. Okay. Nothing complains. Uh, I guess I will have to add some log to see whether there is a resize being triggered and whether there's mouse move event. Mouse move. And mouse down. Okay, so if I try to resize move, correct. Hmm. So I did move this, but then it seems like it doesn't, um, uh, doesn't sh move myself. So I guess it's something similar where in the previous case, where once it has this certain height, it cannot resize to make it smaller. I guess we can set the content to be overflow here and see whether that w fixes this as well. So this is going to have a overflow hidden. Maybe put on the container like this. Um and okay, yeah. So I can resize up and down now. Okay. So um let's let's hide this part. Okay, let's undo the comments. Back. Um so we have this layout and we have this thing. Um, I think this one, it looks a bit bad, nicer if I have like something in between um, that has some color. I think let me change the style a bit of this resizer, which is somewhere here. Uh, we're gonna have the same color as the, as the header and the footer. Okay. And then I will add border as well which is in top and bottom. So I'm going to say border Y, right? Something that like, looks like this. Yep. Something that looks like this looks good for me. Um, probably 300 with the 200, maybe 100, I guess. Yeah. Something like this. Okay. Looks good. So now we have the layouts, the contents, everything comes from a API, right? We can go to level nine and then you can see this um, code for day nine. We can go to day eight. We can see the questions for day eight. 
right? So um, guess we have everything over here as we expect. So the next thing is that we need to be able to uh, get the error, right? As we make changes to our code. Right? So here, um, let's see. We able to set up the code now. And uh, I think one, a few more things over here, like this editor is, we can change both top and bottom, but I guess what we need is actually to make um, the bottom ones to be only read only. So now uh, you can see that it's read only. But previously we have also errors, stuff that squiggly and stuff like that. I think that one turns off when we, um, when we say it's read only, so now we have to turn it back on. Okay, so it's it's read only. We can't change, uh, but still we can still see um, all the errors that's throwing out. Okay, and then I guess next thing is we probably needs to do the user model on did change to to do the validation or type checked, um, and then show the error when there's any errors. Right, so. Uh, so this is what we need. And I guess this one we can, uh, we should call this once as well when we initialize. So I'm gonna refactor it as a function type check. All right, something like this. Uh, type check. And then, okay. Right, so this one async. Oh, this should be a function. Okay, so um, one thing that we need to do, I think every time we re render has something crashes, I think probably it got to do with not cleaning up properly. I'm just guessing, I'm not sure. So. Uh, we can have it on destroy and then tear away everything that we know. Um, so uh, one way is Monaco dot editor dot get I get all the models and then model dot dispose and then also Monaco for all the ed uh, editors for each. Dispose every editor as well. Let's refresh this and see whether if I change, make some small change, whether it's still, yeah. Um, see, uh, the hot reloading will work because um, uh, the previous models and editors have been thrown away and then I recreate them, right? So there's no conflict, especially when I try to recreate the same model, uh, the model with, on the same path, it will not have any errors on that. Okay, so now we have our basic, we have here user model and test model, we copy paste this two, and then we basically want to do the type checked. And type checked, we get our worker, uh, and then we try to get uh, all the errors coming from the, uh, for each of the workers, uh, for each of the, um, editors okay so here um one thing i can see is ts worker um i'm getting all the errors okay i'm gonna collect all the errors and gonna uh maybe set up have a state to know whether there is error or not right so here is the errors equals state false uh, maybe we need two states. One is initialize. Right, so um, first is when we need to have has, has errors. Right, so is before we initialize, as error is false because we have no idea whether there's errors. And once we initialize, we also want to know whether there's error, right, which is when we call type check and see whether any diagnostics, whether there's length more than one and uh, more than zero. Right, and uh, once we initialize, we can show that error. 
and then every time we make changes, we should update this variable that has errors, right? So here, um, we're gonna get semantics for both the user and the test file. So uh, here's kind of how I'm gonna write. Uh, I'm gonna write like this one. So this path should be the user file path. Okay, um, wait. Uh, I guess I will get the test file path as well. Um, I'm gonna have this one. Dot, create an array that can connect everything and then dot length greater than zero and this will be has errors right if the this one the length is greater than zero and i guess once we do the type check initialize is equals to true save this and to know whether we're going to display that we're going to use going to have result over here i'm going to say if if initialize, not initialize, gonna say loading. And if it's initialized but has errors, gonna say has errors. And else, I'm gonna say if all tests pass with a confetti. Save this, let's refresh, loading, and then, hey, is it not working? Is it working? I'm gonna make some changes over here. Seems like it's never initialized, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's check our console, whether we reach there or we have any error typescript not registered uncaught in promise typescript not registered oh oops okay let's see what can we do over here um hmm i think we was working with for us for just now right but then uh i guess it's because of this one right uh maybe when we call this it's not ready let's refresh this um let's see so now, okay, so we actually can type anything over here and it seems like it's, it's giving error. Let's go to day one and see, right? Uh, if I make some changes, then we start type checked. Right, and then if we copy this thing over here, then uh okay, type testing is still not defined, so we still have error. But at least when we start, um, it seems like uh when we when we restart, refresh, and then we start typing, seems like type checking is working because we have errors. Right, only when we initialize, I guess there's something wrong where uh type checked um doesn't give us. So probably we have called it too early on um, before it's fully initialized. So there's a few ways to work on it. Uh, maybe one way is to wait to see whether the TypeScript um, is fully registered. I, I think it's probably coming from um, here when you got worker and then wait for the worker to be registered and stuff. Um, another way I think we can do is basically just keep retrying the type check until it works. Um, so here, I guess we can do this approach first. So can I say, try this one, catch error. So whenever we have an error, then I guess we will just, uh, call type check again, maybe one second later on, right? So this should make sure that it, it will eventually work. So, uh, let's refresh this so loading and then type errors right 
Yep. So yep. Now we can't. We have to fix this, right? So, uh, of course, first thing is we have to have the type testing, right? So how, uh, this path is actually in the somewhere like node modules, but how do you define this, um, this library, this thing that we can use, right? So, um, in Monaco, uh, one thing you can do is actually you can register or you can add a, a, uh, another like library files that you can use, uh, that allows the editor to import from and that and you can do that through this thing called um let me type it out languages dot typescript dot typescript defaults call set extra libs you can set a list of extra libraries so the contents and then the file path uh file node modules Types type so I guess we're gonna create a folder somewhere in like the like just mimic like there's this thing called type testing right that's that's what the library name is and I'm gonna put it in like index dot d dot ts file and for the content we probably need to define that right so we're gonna define that module right now like declare module type testing. Right, and the content will probably be you have to export expect and equal, right? Export this too. Uh right. Um so we we'll probably have to figure out how to write this. Okay, so expect um expect is expect something that is should be equal, right? So I guess it's a, a type that should be equal and oh sorry this is equal I mean, expect should be something that takes in a type that should be equal and also expects this to be equal All right so uh if you pass something you can't expect but you pass something that is not equal then i guess and that not not true then i guess there will be errors that underlines where the expect is and that's that's how it it, it works here right it underlines this part and for equal it should be taken taking two types a and b and we can say that um we need to return true if a is equal to b and return false if a is not b right so i guess we can say a extends b and b extends a then this is true. In other case, it should be false. Save this. And I guess now you can see that it is working as in the error is now highlighting over here because this, this thing is false and then you can pass false to equals, expect, right? So if I copy this, make changes like this. Uh, is our type check not working? Let's add some console log and see whether what is going wrong over here. Let's maybe over here I say type check. Okay, let's save this. Okay, and okay, so if I make changes to my code, I should see type check being printed out again, right? Let's copy this, paste this in. Okay, it seems like uh, it's being called correct. Uh, but I still have some errors, okay? So um, it could be because of the type, the types that I define is incorrect. Not quite sure what's what's the error over here. False does not satisfy constraint true. So um, it could be that, hold on, let me see. So this one, if, a if we hover on, right? This gives us gingerbread chocolate chip. This gives us gingerbread chocolate chip, but the equal, um, this type, A extends B, B extends A. This gives us false. This equal is false. We need to implement a, uh, we need to find a better way of implement this equal type, um, which is, apparently I thought this, this would be correct, but it is not the way to implement. Uh, I'm not quite sure why. 
Um, let me think. What's a better way of implementing this one? Uh, equal a extends b. Okay, it's okay. Uh, one thing maybe we can just try and Google and see whether there's this a npm. Oh, apparently there there is a type expect type typing tester. Um, let's see. Oh, I, I think I, I know another way. Uh, let me go to Advent of TypeScript. Let me hover on top of equal. And let's see what's the definition. So AB is equals to this one. Okay. Um, let me just copy and see what, what this, this gives us. Okay. So um, I guess like this is a... Uh, a different way of defining equals. I will. I I think I need some time to think about how we can better define our expect, uh, our our equal type definition. So now here, uh, once we paste this in, uh, we have a type check and realize that all the pass has passed, right? Um, which is which is great, but it seems like our squiggly squiggly markings hinting is still there, but. This this part is definitely correct, right? We have already made the type test have passed. Uh, over here, once we change this, right? So uh, I think the one next thing to just to polish it up is to update the, uh, the markings. So for this one, I think what we can do is we can go to Monaco, uh, the website, and take a look at some examples. I remember I saw example of a markers right displaying markers over here right so um so i guess we can set model markers or something like that uh when um updates the model markers right so that uh it will be updated rather than still marking at the a you know marking uh, where it still show the old markers. I'm not quite sure why it's not updated, but since it's not updated, we can update it ourselves, right? So let's let's come over here and make some quick change over here. Um, first of all, this is all the diagnostics, and I think we can use we can base on these diagnostics and. Uh, use these diagnostics to actually add markers to our um, to our editor, right? So uh, if you look at over the code over here, the markers, we will set the model. We need to get the model and then we set the markers um, over here, which is an array, okay? So uh, what we can do here is that we... Over here, the model is basically where, which, which files, right? Which is the underlying file, whether the user or the test. So I think we can get the diagnostics for this is for the user, this is for the test, but we need to separate them out to get the marker for each of them, right? And then set uh, the diagnostics for the user and then use the, um, use the uh, user model to set the model markers and then get the diagnostics for the test files, use it to get the uh, test, uh, get the uh, diagnostics for the test files, and then set the markers for test models, okay? Okay, so uh, that's that's our, our goal. I guess it seems like repeating, right? You set, get user uh, diagnostics, and then set user model marker, and then get test diagnostics, sets test model markers. So I, I guess, if it's a bit repetitive, um, we can duplicate the code or we can also do some for loops for us to make it easy for us, right? So here, uh, I guess what we can do is we can for loop uh, for file of this one and this one. Okay, um, so for each of this file, um, what we can do is that we can um, 
gets the model for this one and this one, right? Okay, so first of all, it's of course get the diagnostics. So this is the, a uh, hold on now. I guess we can, we can set a variable called errors. Push this thing. Mm. Okay, I think I can define a variable first. Const diagnostics equals to this one. Diagnostics. Okay. So here, uh, I'll wait for this too. And then once I get the... Uh, actually, you know what? I think this one we can slightly clean up this code. Uh, we can actually, instead of waiting for the first one and then wait for the next one, we can wait for both at the same time and then map it out. Uh, we can use a wait, promise, not all, with the first one. Right, wait this too. And then this whole thing after wait will be a array of arrays. Then we can flat it out like this. Okay, so we get the diagnostics. Of course, we push all the diagnostics here. Um, of course, and, and then, um, so this one later on, we can check where whether has errors is errors push like this and the errors length greater than zero, right? So this one, we can change it like this. Over here with diagnostics, uh, we, oh, of course, we have to use the file instead of user file. Okay, so over here, we get the diagnostics, nothing much has changed, uh, but with the diagnostics, we need to update the markers, right? The set model markers, uh, that looks like something like this, right? So here, um, for each of the diagnostics, we actually need to map it to the mark, uh, to something that looks like a marker. Markers. Right, the marker will have message, severity, start line, start column, end line, end column. Right, so here, uh, the message that we will have is probably, let's see. First of all, severity. Um, Monaco dot marker severity. Uh, we can say error. Oops. Right, and then a uh, message, right, message. Mm, actually diagnostic, let's see, have, what is diagnostics? Uh, hmm, seems like we are getting something weird over here. Promise all this one, she gives us a real diagnostic. Array of diagnostic flat. Hmm. Okay, I think the flat type definition is a bit off. Uh, we can help over here. Uh, this should be giving us the Monaco types. Monaco dot languages typescript dot diagnostics array. Okay, so here diagnostic should just give us diagnostic. And then diagnostic dot uh, message. Is there something like that? Oh, message text. Right, so this is the message text. This is a string or diagnostic message chain. Um, so I think I did some research over here. What we can do here is we can actually use uh, some TypeScript uh, utility to actually make it nicer. Uh, here we can actually say TypeScript, uh, flatten diagnostic message text like this. Flatten it with uh, slash n as a new line. Did 
this should give us a string function implicitly have written any because it doesn't have written type notation. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what the error is about, but yeah, we have the message severity and then we need start line number. We need some start column and line number and column, right? So where do we get all this? Uh, well, the diagnostic should have some starting and ending. I just give starts, which is just a number. Um, I guess in that case, we need to have a way to actually figure out like, I, I believe the start gives us the position in terms of the character uh, starting, right? But then we need to know like what file we're looking at and then uh, we have to count the character and then figure out where, which line or which column it that char the character position should be falling at. So it, it's, it's, it will be based on what file we're looking at. And I, I believe the, the file model itself, the model that we are looking at, should have this information uh, or should be able to give us the this information when, with the specific um, starting position, right? So we need to get a model as well. So let, let's pause over here. Let's get some model that we need. Um, so the model for this one, this file, uh, this current file, right? Did we get uh, the user or the test? And then we need to get the user model or the test model. Um, we can write it like if we can have something like model equals like if a file equals user file path give us the user model or the test model. Right, we can actually write something like this. Or if you want to have like slightly more nicer way, uh or, or more generic way, which is actually given the path that we have, we can actually ask Monaco. Uh get uh what's it called? Get model, I think. Get oh wait, hold on. Editor dot get model. And it takes in a URI. So we can turn to the file. Oh, it's just a string. We can again, Monaco, oops, Monaco, Monaco dot UI dot get parse the string to get us the UI, and then we can use this UI to get the model, and this should give us the model that we need, right? So this is generic enough to get a model, and with the model we can actually get. Uh, get position at based on the starting or ending position, right? So this model, we know it for sure it's there. We can have uh, null assertions. And this position gives us a position object, which should give should have something like a column and line number, right? Um, so what we can do here is that we're going to use this turn this into a function instead. Start equals to get the start position uh, and ending position uh, there's no end. Okay, I guess then we can say starts plus the diagnostic dot length, right? Uh, this should be knowledge. Okay, uh, so we have the start and end, and here what we can do is this is the start dot um, line number, this is the start dot column, this is the end line number, this is the column, right? So we get the markers, right? So first is we get the diagnostics to let us know what are the errors. And then later on, we turn the diagnostics into markers, and then we can set model markers. Model dot. Oh, sorry, editor set model markers. So Monaco dot editor dot set model markers. 
with the model owner. Um, I guess for now we're going to call the model dot get language. But basically, who owns these markers? And I guess uh, TypeScript owns it. Then we say it's TypeScript's markers. And here we have the markers um, like this, right? That we just created. Save this. Uh, let's come back to our code. Let's take a look. Uh, now it's error and it shows has errors. And if you copy this and paste it in, all the markers are gone and then all tests have passed. And then we've completed this UI, right? And if you try to make some change over here, okay, this is straight only. When I try to make some changes, you can see the errors. Markers is updated as we type. And then this also show errors as we type as well. Right, so I think that's, that's roughly about it, uh, about our event of type script clone um over i guess we spent quite a while uh two hours plus to build this but as you can see we have built a ui that allows you to have a flexible layout right resizable layout and then also we have built a two editor using monaco where you can type and make changes over here in your code and you can see that uh, it shows whether there is any errors or not uh, on your editor, right? So actually there's a lot of things you can build on top over here. For example, the markers, um, You now we already know all the diagnostics. Uh, we can actually show like why something is wrong based on the diagnostic messages. Uh, based on these markers, we can actually um, draw lines or draw certain uh, more interesting uh, markers onto the editors to show uh, to show you like what is uh, wrong or what is right or where you can improve on, right? So that is about today. Uh, we have built this a TypeScript, even of TypeScript clones with Svelkit, with Playwright and Monaco. If you like this kind of content, hit the like button and also let me know what other, other ideas I can explore in the comment section below. And remember to subscribe so that you'll be notified when the next video is out. So see ya. Bye-bye.